So I'd like to begin by thanking all the organizers for the opportunity to speak here, particularly because it gave me a chance to be part of yesterday's celebration. So congratulations, Deepak. And uh, also because uh, speaking here means speaking in front of an assembled array of experts. So hopefully uh, I'll get some feedback. So this is work we have been doing, uh, actually starting this paper in 2016, very slowly, uh, in very confused ways. Uh, but by now, I think we understand a few things. So I'd like to tell you about them. Uh, so part of uh, what was done uh, was the work of Shonak Biswas, Mursalin Islam, and Ritesh Bhola. Uh, that's published. And uh, there's some other stuff that's more recent. Uh, some of it not yet out. So uh, since it's Thursday and we have been listening to talks from Monday, let me try and give you four slides which kind of summarize what I want to say. And then the rest of it, uh, if you still pay attention, that's a bonus for me. So uh, what do we study? So we are studying maximally packed dimer models on diluted lattices. Uh, so let me unpack that. So let me start with a glossary of terms. Uh, so when I say diluted, I, I mean vacancy disorder, quench. So randomly, some sites are deleted from a lattice. This can, in various physical contexts, model various kinds of things. I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, when I talk of maximum matchings, well, what's a matching? It's an attempt to pair each vertex of the lattice with exactly one neighbor via uh, putting a hardcore dimer down on the link connecting those two vertices. So uh, it's not a fully packed dimer a situation, but it's dimers being put down on hardcore dimers being put down on links. An unmatched vertex uh, is also a monomer. Uh, I'll use that language interchangeably. Uh, what's a maximum matching? Well, you try to put as many dimers down as possible without violating the hardcore constraint. Uh, so leave as few vertices unmatched as possible. Uh, this uh, is understood nicely in terms of alternating and augmenting paths. So let me just say what that is. So let's say there's a monomer in a maximum matching because not all graphs can be perfectly matched. If it can be perfectly matched, that means no site is left unmatched. That's a fully packed dimer cover. Uh, but if you can't, there'll be some monomer. So you can start from the monomer, go along an empty edge, then go along a dimer, then empty edge, then dimer, then empty edge, then dimer. This is an alternating path. And a good characterization of maximum matchings, uh, if and only if characterization, is that maximum matchings uh, have no augmenting parts. Okay, so that's the glossary of terms. Uh, so sorry, I went. I should have said that a bit better, maybe. So hang on. So look, look at this path. It's an alternating path, but it starts from a monomer and ends at a monomer. So now I can just shift all the dimers by one to the left and I'll have room to add one more dimer. So that means the matching I started with is not a maximum. I can put one more dimer down. So this is an if and only if statement. Uh, a matching is maximum if and only if there are no augmenting parts. Okay. So what, what is the question we are interested in? Uh, I want to know uh, what's the number of monomers in the maximally packed dimer model as a function of vacancy density. So I'm imagining some reg underlying regular lattice, square, cubic, triangular, whatever, depending on the context. It's going to have some randomly placed vacancies, quench disorder. And I want to know how many monomers are there in, the in this maximally packed dimer model. Right? That's one question. The second question is, where do these monomers live? That's the second question. Okay. So, so, those are, so that's the setting. These are the questions. And uh, not moving. Oh, ah, so no, that went by too fast. OK, I think, yeah. Why ask these questions? That's the next thing I should tell you. So uh, for now, just take it from me. And I hope some of this will become clear that we are asking these questions because we actually came to this problem in a rather tortuous way, starting with something completely different. Uh, and uh, we came to it because the answers to these questions would have implications first for particle hole symmetric quantum percolation at the band center uh, on a bipartite lattice like the cubic lattice. 
uh, for collective myelina fermion excitations of networks of localized myelina modes uh, and for other things which I won't have time to talk about in this talk. Uh, this split I have made into the first two and the next three because the first two formed the motivation and the original questions that led us to this problem. Uh, the next three are kind of spin-offs. So what do we find? This is the last of the four slides after which you can check out if you like. Uh, well, first, we find percolation phenomena uh, of monomer carrying regions that I am going to call R-type regions for historical reasons of personal history. Uh, and these percolation phenomena have nothing to do with the geometric percolation transition of the diluted lattice. They are deep within the percolated phase uh, with an infinite cluster of the, so geometrically there's just an infinite cluster, but then there are some percolation phenomena having to do with where the monomers live in this maximally packed dynamo. Uh, inside the percolated phase of these monomers of these monomer carrying regions, we find in the bipartite case in three dimensions, a further sublattice symmetry breaking transition, which I find very intriguing, I'll tell you about. And perhaps the most confusing thing from my point of view is that in the non bipartite case, let's say a triangular lattice, we find a very unusual zero, what I'm calling a zero half threshold behavior at the percolation transition. And let me say what I mean by this. In regular geometric percolation and in many variants of that, you tune some parameter, which is some kind of dilution, bond dilution, side dilution, and boom, there's one infinite cluster that appears with probability one in the thermodynamic mode, right? That's the zero one law. Uh, so this is supposed to be an example of uh, the zero one law for tail events in probability theory or something like that. So uh, this is a takeoff on that. I'm calling it zero half because what we find is that you do this dilution beyond some dilution uh, fraction, roughly half the samples have monomer regions that percolate, the other half don't. So this seems to violate some very general principle, except that, you know, that general principle is about some independent events and things here are highly correlated. Okay. So these, these are the sort of findings. So, so that, that's the talk really. Now I'll tell you why we started studying it in a bit more detail. So let, let me just say a few uh, general statements that are obvious to almost everybody in the room, but worth repeating. So in condensed matter systems, quench disorder often matters very much. Uh, and because of disorder, if you're thinking in a particle picture, particles scatter and diffuse. Sometimes they diffuse anomalously. Uh, matter waves we know can also localize because of interference effects. Uh, so if I'm thinking of a classical transport of a fluid, the simplest uh, setting for this is just a porous random medium. And it's the random geometry of the medium that determines the fluid transport. Uh, and that's the paradigm of percolation, right? Uh, if you think in terms of matter waves, uh, then uh, you have Anderson localization of electrons. Uh, you have localization of quasi particles. And in this context, we know that the symmetries of the disordered Hamiltonian, the symmetries of the ensemble of disordered Hamiltonians matter uh, and decide what kind of localization phenomena we have. Right? Uh, so the simplest lattice model for localization would be just a tight binding model in which you have random hoppings between neighbors on some lattice. Uh, some random potentials, and you want to solve this lattice Schrodinger equation and look at the wave function, right? As a function of chemical potential, as a function of the energy. So epsilon is the energy, uh, psi is the wave function. These are the hopping amplitudes. These are the random potentials, and uh, it's just the Schrodinger equation. Uh, here you would put in vacancy disorder simply by deleting some sites from this lattice. That orbital doesn't exist. So you would define this model on the diluted graph, right? And, and this leads me to what, what used to be called quantum percolation in its heyday. Uh, this is sort of the closest point of contact between Anderson localization and geometric percolation. You have vacancy disorder, but no external random potential. And so the question these uh, people asked is, can the quantum electron fluid become localized 
even in a regime where the corresponding classical fluid would diffuse and be able to go from one end to the other, right? So inside the, uh, you can, hopping disorder is okay, but not potential energy. I'll come to that in a minute, right? So uh, in the simplest setting, actually, they put nothing in except vacancies. That's these classic papers. That was their original motive. And uh, the simplest example of a quantum percolation problem uh, is just a particle hopping on a randomly diluted bipartite line. Bipartite uh, is a natural model for binary alloys. Uh, you can imagine one of the constituents doesn't have some orbital and the other one does. And so you get vacancies whenever one of the constituents is at that site. And you can have possibly random hopping amplitudes between nearest neighbor sites. And this has an extra symmetry, a bipartite symmetry. Uh, so states in that Schrodinger equation with energy epsilon, non-zero, will always have a partner at energy minus epsilon. That's very easy to see. You change the sign of the wave function on one sublime. Uh, this symmetry is broken by random potentials, next nearest neighbor hopping. I'm leaving all that out. And how am I doing on time? 23 minutes. Good. So this, uh, without the vacancies, this is what's called the Gade Wegener problem. Uh, just random hopping on a bipartite lattice at zero chemical potential. Right? So epsilon equal to zero is special. And the Gade Wegener problem says what's the asymptotic low energy behavior of rho of epsilon? That was their question, which they managed to answer. And it has a it has a pretty baroque answer in the sense that the density of states near zero has this divergence with some very complicated form. That's not the subject of today's talk. Uh, I worked on it many years ago. More recently, we went back to it in the context of diluted graphene. And we realized that uh, the, the solution to this problem changes a little bit when there are vacancies. There's a very long crossover to the gardier wegener scaling. And this is where we come to my talk today. There is an extra feature which is key. There's a non-zero density in the thermodynamic limit of zero modes. Modes pinned exactly to the band center. So here's the numerical evidence for this. Uh, you know, this is the density of exact zero modes as a function of system size. And you can see we have reached the thermodynamic limit in our simulations and it's non-zero. This is the density of zero modes as a function of concentration of vacancies. It's some smooth curve. So, so there are these zero modes, right? Uh, and so we spent a long time puzzling over where these come from. It looks very unusual to have modes pinned at a certain energy, a non-zero density of it, a delta function in the density of states, if you will. And we came up with this uh, picture for what they could be. And we were guided by the fact that these modes, their number didn't seem to change if we put on hopping disorder. So the, the, they seem to be insensitive to the details of the values of the hopping amplitudes only sensitive to the yes no question is there a connection between this site and that so they cared about whether the hopping is zero or non zero but not about the non zero value so guided by that we had this idea that maybe they come about in the following way uh, imagine in this bipartite lattice there's some rare region whose site boundary is all a sub lattice and who's uh, uh, got this unusual morphology that in spite of the site boundary being all a sub lattice the vacancies have arranged themselves in such a way that the number of B sites is bigger than the number of B sites or vice versa. You can see very easily that in such a situation, I can construct IB equal to NB minus NA wave functions <coughs> at zero energy simply by saying that I will put wave function uh, amplitudes on all the A sites, in, uh, sorry, on all the B sites in this interior, uh, nothing on the B sites outside and nothing on the A side. So this is a mode that will live on the B sites inside this RB region. And why am I guaranteed to have IB of them? Well, that's just the rank nullity theorem. If you wish, the number of constraints is NA, number of variables is NB, I can always do this, right? So this was this really simple-minded idea that maybe this is what is going on. There are these rare regions with this very peculiar morphology. This morphology is very important, uh, which allows for this density of zero modes. And uh, we realized quickly that it's not hard to draw these pictures. So, you know, here's a picture. So, these six red dots are the vacancies. 
and uh, this is the graphene lattice i've got six vacancies here and you can convince yourself very easily that there is one zero mode that i can construct on all the black dots completely independent of what i do anywhere else and this is an example of a, what i call an r type reason r was chosen for robust because these modes are robust to disorder uh but the major puzzle remained yeah is it is zero mode or yeah so this just counting you count how many b sites you have to write down the schrodinger equation on uh, it's one less than the number of a sites on which i can put variables <laughs> yeah so in this case the difference is one so this number in this case i've just rigged it up so that ib is one or ia is one so so I, i this of course proves nothing it's just one picture uh, but this shows that so this if you wish this picture is a lower bound a rigorous lower bound on the density of zero modes right because with some probability that i can estimate in every box of some size these six vacancies can come together right and that's it right yes thank you that so if you uh, uh take out sites on a random what is the probability Very distribution low. of the of this uh, of the r regions of a given size exactly so so this for example i drew this picture i said it's a lower bound but in fact that's the next slide the actual density of zero modes is way larger than this naive lower bound this is a very low probability even to get six vacancies like this at low dilution right but there is a huge density of zero modes that we measured so the puzzle exactly was what dominates what is the structure of these r type regions what's the distribution of their size and that's the whole talk and i have no theory for it these are all numerical experiments i'll be doing okay so I'll let me say that up front so but at this point i haven't even told you how i would construct these regions right i've drawn one picture so so this is where maximum matching come because we struggled for i don't know a very long time over this uh and then there was a kind of an idea which is that you know since they depend only on the connectivity and rely on these r type regions let's say this is true and these r type regions basically what are they they are regions with local sublattice imbalance locally the number of a sites is more than the number of b sites or vice versa right and uh, if you think about dimer covers what a dimer does is, is matches a a site to a b site and so wherever you have dimers that you can put down perfectly there is no local sublattice imbalance on the lattice scale you have matched things so suggest thinking in terms of matchings uh, the idea would be that wherever you can't put a perfect dimer cover down wherever there are monomers that's where you will be able to make these zero modes that's where you will have these r type regions this is very vague right yes in fact we investigated that uh, the numerical density that i showed is just numerics so this contains all the zero modes but i'll show you soon that i can also count these kinds of zero modes and then the difference is very tiny this uh, these robust zero modes seem to dominate uh, the density in fact the other modes are negligible that's true so that's why we started thinking about maximum matchings so that's one part of the story why are we doing this that was the reason the other part uh, is majorana networks so there has been a lot of speculative work saying you can build a quantum computer and one of the speculations is that there are these phases of matter that which have majorana modes localized majorana modes as their excitations and uh, in the ideal case you would just have a pair of them and uh, that would be your quantum resource but in the non ideal case you'll have many of them and they'll talk to each other and uh, with some weak mixing amplitudes a and you would have to deal with a hamiltonian like this uh these etas are majorana operators which means they are the real and imaginary parts of a regular fermion uh and i'm just drawing uh, writing down a generic majorana network which is a quadratic form in these etas with some pure imaginary anti symmetric mixing matrix right that that is the non ideality that uh, any realization would have to deal with because they will mix and if they mix uh they cause dephasing and there are problems this is the claim so which leads to the natural question uh, are there zero energy collective excitations of the network as as a whole because if there are those are also majorana fermions they are collective majorana modes of the whole network 
and they could serve as a non-local resource for computing, right? So, so I want to again ask the same question then in this context, when can I find collective Majorana excitations of such a network? Right? What characterizes the zero modes of this network? And that's basically asking, what are the zero energy eigenvectors of a pure imaginary anti-symmetric That's the question. So that's the other context in which I worry about zero modes. If the network is bipartite, there's a simple transformation I can make. Uh, just uh, put an I in front of uh, all the B sub lattice sites, and I can transform this matrix to just a regular real symmetric matrix on the bipartite light. I'm back to the old problem of uh, bipartite random hopping, right? So there, if I can have these R-type regions, I can construct these uh, Majorana modes, collective Majorana modes. How much time do I have? 14 minutes, very good. I also had a question. So, so yes. far you have not, you made statements about the number of these R regions. Yes, I've said, yeah, 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 yeah. So, spatial absolutely. Area. I want to know where they live. I've not told you yet. Right. And as you can imagine, that's an interesting question, both in the context of the quantum percolation problem and in this context. Right. In fact, that's the key question in both cases. So, but that was just the bipartite case. I don't know anything about zero modes in the non-bipartite case, right? Because, well, I don't know. Because, you know, first of all, the way I was thinking about these zero modes, these robust zero modes goes out of the window. There's no two sub lattice decomposition of the triangular lattice. There's no sense in which there is or is not local sub lattice imbalance. So none of that makes any sense anymore, right? So where are these modes going to come from if they exist? Either? So the key point, uh, and this again took a very long time to realize, uh, was that non-bipartite lattices are non-bipartite because they have triangles or pentagons or something like that in their connectivity, odd loops, right? And if you have a pure imaginary anti-symmetric matrix on a triangle, it has a zero mode. Because you see a pure imaginary anti this is just high school linear algebra or whatever, pure imaginary anti-symmetric matrix has a plus minus epsilon symmetry again. A triangle has three sides, so there are three modes. One has to be at zero, independent of the values. True for any odd loop, right? So maybe the right way to think, is there a question? Right way to think is that, you know, the zero modes of the full network are somehow built from linear combinations of these elementary modes that survive their mixing, right? So, so that was the other idea that we wanted to explore or I wanted. Uh, and so now I think there's enough vagueness. Let me now be a bit more precise. 12 minutes, that's good. So, uh, so of course, to be more precise is beyond my ability alone. I have to kind of stand on the shoulder of very big people. The first of which is Longway Higgins, about whom I actually, I must confess, I knew nothing until I encountered him in this context. But in 1950, he wrote a paper, Some Studies in Molecular Orbital Theory. Uh, where he's looking at which benzene-like molecules have local moments and he's doing molecular orbital theory and the question reduces to finding whether or not there are zero modes of some mixing matrix. And uh, all this I got out of his Wikipedia page, it's quite amazing. So restated in my language, what Longway Long Higgins showed is the following. The number of monomers in any maximum matching of a bipartite graph gives the number of topologically protected zero modes of the corresponding tight binding. This is the statement. Okay. By topologically protected, I simply mean you can change the non-zero hopping amplitudes whichever way you like. Just don't convert zeros to non-zeros <coughs> and non-zeros to zeros. That's all. So for a network, I think that's a reasonable definition of topology. Uh, and in graph theory, this was discovered, I think, about 10 years after Longway Higgins by another great scientist, Edmonds, of the Edmonds algorithm. And uh, it's known as the non-zero defect generalization of Kutz theorem. But what do these zero modes look like? That was the question. And as Titadi anticipated, there are consequences to the answer to that question. First of all, you know, if we could find a maximally localized basis in the zero mode subspace, I could compute the Green's function at zero energy. And then uh, the localization length of these basis vectors would tell me something about transport. That is in the context of diluted graphene. In the Majorana mode context, 
knowing the extent of the best linear combination i can make tells me something about uh, how well they will be protected against uh, local probes and so on right so there's a partial answer from that old paper of longwetty gibbs uh, it says the set of all sites that again this is paraphrasing what he writes in our language set of all sites that host a monomer in at least one maximum matching that set of sites is the support of all topologically protected zero mode wave functions so all the null vectors live in in those sites right but we want more right we want some general algorithm for identifying what i'm calling these r type regions i'm i'm still very attached to my construction i want to know if i can make that work and i'm hoping that will because i'm thinking very locally i'm hoping that will give me a maximally localized basis for this zero mode okay so we managed to do that and the key progress involved again really uh, amazing work by earlier people uh, in this case dulmaj and mendelson so they have a structure theory of bipartite graphs which allows me to construct these regions and uh, in its r 5 okay 8 what is 8 okay so maybe you can take it on faith that there is a way and i will skip this part of labeling sites of a bipartite lattice even odd or unreachable actually i can just say in a minute that even if you can get to them with even number of steps from a monomer odd if odd number of steps unreachable if you can't reach them and once you find this labeling there is a way then of making connected clusters and getting to this picture and uh, what this picture shows is that uh, i can decompose the whole graph into so the dulmaj mendelson decomposition is a theorem about these labels and saying that these labels are unique no matter which maximum matching you start from but now the way i'm going to use this theorem is once i have these labels i make these components these connected components and i look at them and i notice that they have exactly the same morphology that i was imagining when i wrote down these r type regions they have a boundary which is the locally minority sublattice and the locally majority sublattice is in the bulk of the region and so i can make these wave functions in these regions right so that that's uh this is if you wish an alternate proof of that theorem of uh, edmonds or longer tegens it's a local proof and because it's a local proof it gives me this construction of a maximally local i can do the same thing for non bipartite networks this was another step that took a long time very confusing but in the non bipartite case there's a somewhat more complicated decomposition theorem that goes by the name of galai and edmonds theorem galai edmonds decomposition which basically says you have three kinds of sites in a non bipartite graph sites that are always covered by dimers this is the unreachable stuff green we can forget about it sites that always have dimers between them and other sites that could have a monomer in some maximum match so these are called the factor critical components notice that they are all odd in size and are either triangles or pentagons or things on top of triangles that are odd loops and for each of these there is exactly one zero mode so now all i'm going to do is run my old idea again i'm going to imagine each of these critical factor critical components as some super sites and i'm going to build a fake bipartite graph this is what i do i build a fake bipartite graph in which i delete all these vertices i delete all the brown connections between these different odd sites i collapse each of these factor critical components into single sites and then i have a bipartite graph between these super sites c and these sites o and now this bipartite graph only has if i call the super sites a a type and the uh, other sites b type it's this fake bipartite graph it only has it's an auxiliary graph it only has ra regions no rb regions and it has ia monomers in any maximum match any such region has those many monomers and those many topologically protected zero modes this time of ia right this is the generalization and so again uh, this theorem is known that the total numbers are equal total numbers of monomer equal to total number of uh, topologically protected zero modes goes by the name of the loas anderson theorem but this what i've got now is a local proof and that gives me a construction of these modes so 
After this, there's a lot of grunt work. We have to do the numerics. So we find one maximum matching, put these labels, use some simple burning algorithm to construct these regions and then look at their random number. And this is what we've been playing around with for some time now. And let me tell you what we find. Three minutes. Oh, that's great. Okay, very good. I'm almost done. Now I have to just show you some pictures and tell you what happens. So first statement is at low dilution on in the bipartite case, let's say diluted honeycomb lattice, the typical R-type regions are huge, right? So this is some 5,000 by 5,000 sample with periodic boundary condition. And uh, what these guys have done is they've color coded the biggest three R-type regions. So this is the site boundary of the biggest three R-type regions. And you can see they're huge. The white stuff is lots of other stuff which they've just not drawn, right? So that's the first statement. They get very big at small dilution. So now to answer Shubro's question, there's clusters on all scales and we are doing experiments to look at them, right? It is, it is. That's why this blue connects with this blue, that blue with that blue, yes. So now we look at something more precise because these clusters are so big, we start thinking in terms of percolation. I want to know whether I can go from one end of the sample to the other inside a single R-type region, because if I can, the Green's function for zero modes will have that extent and there will be conduction. Uh, if I cannot, there is no conduction at zero end. It's very sharp, sharp statement. So I look at uh, what in an open sample would have been called the crossing probability. Here, because I have periodic boundary conditions, it's the wrapping problem. So I ask if there's at least one cluster in the sample that wraps. Uh, and here I'm showing you this probability as a function of dilution and various sizes ranging from 10,000 by 10,000 to 26,000 by 10,000. Uh, and uh, so in percolation theory, I'm sure this audience knows, I don't have to show you this. The crossing or wrapping probabilities would cross at a critical point of percolation. They are not crossing, but they look like they want to cross at zero. So what we did is we asked if we can uh, make a scaling theory of this with this assumption that there's incipient percolation, a zero dilution critical point, and it works beautifully with the exponent of 5.1 with some larger share. 5.1 plus minus 0.5 is what I would say conservative. But it works, right? This fit, the fact that everything is falling on one. Fiddle around with it by I, you say, okay, I don't like this fit, that's 5.5. I don't like that fit, that's 4.8, 5.1. Very crude, right? I don't have a more sophisticated view of this. I don't know one. And the same exponent works with theta equal to zero, interestingly, for the standard susceptibility that people use to look at population, right? The mass susceptibility. On the cubic lattice, there's actual percolation transition at a non-zero dilution. So the, here you see these are crossing, this wrapping probability. That's the crossing point. You can scale it. Now the exponent is 0.87 and uh, I struggled with whether I should add that last digit, but we actually know it's not 5.5 and not 5.7. So please excuse me for having that fourth digit. No, I, this is a terrible thing, right? Sometimes you just write more digits than you should. So uh, the chi again seems to be fitting well with eta of zero, but you know, if you want to be precise, all I can say is eta is less than 0 0.07. It, it, pretty much anything between zero and 0 0.07 will work. Uh, but it's less than zero. Uh, most interestingly, deep in the percolated phase of these monomers, there's a second transition, which is a sublattice symmetry breaking transition. So what I'm showing here is the mass of the largest RA region minus the largest RB region mod divided by, by total mass. This jumps, some first order jump. Right. So what's going on is clearer if you look at this. I'm showing you the number of clusters that wrap in all three directions of the cubic lattice as a function of dilution inside the percolated phase. It jumps from two to one. So there's once you percolate, there are two R-type regions that percolate together, one A-type, one B-type. 
and then at a lower dilution spontaneously one of them takes over eats up the other it jumps to okay so now let's go to the non bipartite case now i'm going to look at when i say r type regions now i'm talking about where the zero modes live two minutes yeah so let me just so here there's something even uh, well not so clean looking but more interesting i feel so i'm showing the total mass of sites inside r type regions as a function of dilution and notice all my dilution numbers are always inside the geometrically percolated phase this has nothing to do with the geometric percolation right so here you have uh, hardly any change but a lot of noise beyond some point which i have shaded the range of dilution where there is noise i have shaded so we have very hard time getting good clean answers here so why do we have a hard time because the distribution of the total sites in r type regions is bimodal below some dilution i'm showing that here right so sometimes most of the sites in the sample 80% are in r type regions sometimes very few are roughly 50 50 i mean the strength of the peaks is roughly equal right um and at the critical point which this time i'm going to just put three digits down roughly uh, there's a broader distribution but it's not by so what's going on so let's now you know i have some 10000 samples i split them depending on whether or not most of the sites are r type or not right so whether or not the sample belongs to the left peak or the right if it belongs to the left peak i'll call it p type because most of the sites are actually perfectly matched by dimers in any maximum matching otherwise i'll call it r type so now you can see what's going on so when a sample is r type the number of things that can be always matched by dimers is very small Uh, uh and the largest cluster is very big when it's p type it's very small so it's sort of doing this thing right and many more pictures that establish the same thing this this sort of zero to half behavior but before i talk of zero to half i should show you that there is a transition so there is a percolation transition here's the crossing probability uh which Uh, is wrapping in two directions. I'm calling that P cross. There is a crossing point. Uh, we can scale it. It's universal the scaling in the sense that I can use the same mu of 1.4 to fit the triangular lattice. And well, I don't know what to call this lattice. I call it snub square, but I think maybe it's the Shastri Sutherland lattice. It's is this thing where you take a square lattice and you put diagonals in alternate plaquettes in alternating directions. right it's a different lattice no good reason for it to have exactly the same behavior but the scaling is the same so we have a percolation transition which has some sort of zero half percolation threshold half the samples percolate half the samples don't uh we can fit a, this time there's a non zero eta we can measure and this is not an estimate of criticality we have a data point here that's why i've put so many digits i'm saying this because deepak's in the audience Okay, and since I've already said what my conclusions were, here's something for the Woodhouse fans. Thank you. And I should flash my questions. I'm just looking at eigenstates. so i mean uh, so in the case where this r region sort of percolate through so that, that means the zero modes are uh, going expanding the yes and you said that these zero modes are topologically protected and so on but is are these like i mean zero modes in topological insulators where which lead to quantization so i think you have to be careful about what one means by topology for me topology is a statement that i have this graph i have this uh, lattice with connections the strength of the connection doesn't matter the yes no question about whether the connection exists or not matters right once it exists i don't care what value it has i'm calling that topological um, i think it's a reasonable definition call them protected if you like so so i don't think they have anything to do with topological insulators no that has to do with the wave function the band wave function twisting in k space and so on No, no. So this has a, a very dramatic consequence for conductance, right? If you have a single R-type region that goes from one end to the other, 
you have conductance at uh, the at the band center otherwise you simply don't because the localization length of the greens function is strictly bounded above by the size of these regions but is the zero mode in the band it's in the middle of the band yeah it's right in the band center yeah yeah and there's a delta function there so it's a non zero density so it contributes to current I had a question. So, sure. is there a possibility that the size of your R regions that scales anomalously with the system size? Uh, what do you mean by R anomalously? Uh, it's not. It's neither macroscopic. It's neither neither order one nor order one. Uh, so, it's certainly or, well order one in the sense mass in the region divided by L, L to the d. Yeah, the, that goes to zero in the what I'm calling the unpercolated region. Yes, but and it certainly goes to a non-zero number in the percolated region. At the critical point, it's something, right? And in fact, that's the whole point of this. This, so this tells you what it is at the critical point, right? This eta, the, the bipartite case, for example. Uh, yeah. So here, so bipartite case eta is zero. So you know how it scales. Where is it gone? There you go. Uh, bipartite case eta is zero. So you know how it scales. See. Okay. Will you make some comments about connection of this problem to ABC percolation, three color percolation uh, in three, three dimensions? Beyond the stupid things I've said on the phone to you? <laughs> I have even forgotten what you said on the phone, so say it again. Uh, well, the point is here A and B is very correlated with each other. Uh, so that's the difference, I think. Right? The point is your actual dilution is uncorrelated, of course, but then you are doing this incredibly complicated, correlated, nonlinear thing of giving labels odd, even, and free, right? Uh, that carries information about the correlations in a maximum matching or in the ensemble of maximum matching. So when you talk of ABC percolation, they are independent labels. This is what in we were. The large scale would yeah. this um, A type regions or. Are A type regions, B type regions, will they be equivalent to the A type and B type regions in the percolation? No, because you see, if I slightly change uh, the connections, uh, you have to be very careful. You can completely change uh, an R type region by adding one connection, right? So, so there's very long range correlations between the labels. I do something here, the label somewhere else. I mean, as far away as the size of the largest region can change. So somehow I've not been able to get rid of that effect, but I can make some statements. There are certain kinds of extra connections you can add that are that protect or that, that stable. So this, this pictures I'm drawing, let me just go to this picture. They are stable to certain kinds of things. So inside an R-type region, if I add extra bonds between two A's, even that doesn't change much. But you know, every once in a while, I'll add a bond that connects the a RA region to the neighboring RB region, which can be nearest to it. And poof, they can either uh, go away completely and become P or merge and have a smaller density of zero modes, which is the difference of the monomers on the two. And, and so there's this enormous, so the very fact that they are very large in size also means that these labels are very correlated. And, and so I don't know how to, this is where I'm stuck. Exactly. sites uh, which are in one of these yes uh, are not independent in the sense that you know i mean if you had a b c then if two sites are inside it yeah. they are by definition fully dependent uh, so i mean so then that's the size of the region right right so and that's the one that's diverging is the size of the region yeah which is diverging at criticality yeah. and i'm trying to understand the critical point so obviously i can't understand the critical point by talking of uncorrelated yeah that, that is the problem. I mean, it doesn't seem to be a good handle on this. I mean, it's a natural question, mm -hmm. but there doesn't seem to be any technique to use to answer it other than to do uh, numerical experiments. If you made a lot of color pictures of these with lots of different clusters. Yes. 
would they look like abc um, clusters on the large scale uh, this i haven't tried this i haven't tried i should try that but you know the, i should say another thing i i am now beginning to be certain that although these things look like very nice random things they are basically composed out of some very simple elements uh, so one element is this so let's take the honeycomb lattice right so you take this site and uh, take this site and this site and delete these neighbors uh, am i drawing this right no sorry this way yeah so delete this neighbor delete this neighbor so now there's got to be one monomer that lives here or here and uh, this is the way it can so this has to be matched to this dive here or here in that so these three things this is the elementary r type region uh, of the honeycomb lattice and and these things get tied somehow to produce these pigri uh yeah but i haven't made more progress Yeah, so sorry, I was just wondering. So this argument works just for zero modes, yeah. But you have a whole host of modes. Um, suppose you bias your lat, by your the chemical potential. Chemical potential. So all bets are off. Then those are those those modes care about everything. You see, here I manage to just forget about the outside world and talk about things that live in a region. That doesn't work anymore. You have to actually solve the Schrodinger. But and, and that is the so for the honeycomb lattice, for example, that's the Gade Wegener problem. that that is exactly what i was uh, giving as prehistory if you wish uh, sorry this is taking a little longer than it should yeah so uh, that's this stuff that's this stuff and i think it's a very interesting open question for people who like to think in very coarse grained ways to ask how can they put this physics into the sort of sigma models that gardi and wegner write down what deepak would call field theory mumbo jumbo So, <laughs> so there is some field theory mumbo jumbo that leads to very precise answers, which is slightly wrong. And Lessig Motronic's thesis corrected that. But uh, now with vacancies, there's this extra crossover which has to do with the zero mode density, and there doesn't seem to be any good way of putting that into the sigma. Model. That's an open question. But but is there a region of the chemical potential regime of the chemical potential for which this is valid? Like, is there a no scale? no? So so the physics away from exactly zero. is uh, so actually that physics away from exactly zero can also be thought of little bit in terms of dimers and, and it's the optimum defect problem in a disordered uh, uh, dimer so you have this what they call bragg glass or something you have these dimers with different uh, weights and, and you want to make the optimum defect you want to remove two monomers what's the optimum defect for how much energy does it cost that answering the scaling of that Uh, which has some very beautiful theory behind it that uh, Pierre Ledoucel and David Carponti have worked on. That goes into uh, what we did uh, to modify the field theory. So the physics is very, very much more complicated, I mean, and very much more uh, well. Okay, just more complicated. Are there any further questions? Okay. Uh, if not, let's uh, thank you.